Okay, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be back, and I, uh, I'll start by just thanking everybody for coming and just saying what an amazing conference it is. I, I, as uh, Tony said, I initiated the larger scale conferences uh, a little over 10 years ago, but uh, this, I think, uh, is probably the pinnacle um, in terms of the numbers and, indeed, the, uh, the quality of the uh, speakers, I think. Um, so that's great. I'm going to uh, talk today mainly about, um, I had to think up a title here, and uh, I was, uh, Jim Davies and I have been working on, on wealth inequality mainly. Jim is going to talk tomorrow and present uh, some of our data. So our division of labor is, I thought I would talk about the, more about the methods. Um, and I thought, well, this is going to be really boring for people, so I've uh, tried to say new methods. But as it, as it happens, I, I think um, every 10 years I have a good idea, and I think I had a good idea this year. So I'm, I'm quite excited about it, and uh, I'm going to share it with the audience for the first time. In fact, I'm going to share it with my co-authors probably for the first time as well, because uh, they, they, they don't really know what I've been doing, at least in detail. Um, so, uh, let me move on and say a little bit. Uh, I need to just mention the collaborat collaborators. About um, 10 years ago, um, when I was director here, we decided uh, to think about a, wealth, uh, a project on wealth holdings, which is a little bit uh, sort of unusual in the development field. Um, and Jim Davies uh, ran the project. And one of our little um, project uh, papers was to do with thinking about could we develop um, a global, uh, a world wealth inequality database effectively? Could we generate an estimate of what uh, wealth inequality is on a global scale? Um, that's difficult enough in the income field. Uh, Branko Milanovic is the one who's been really uh, doing most of the uh, leading the way there. But uh, in, the, in the wealth field, anyone who knows about wealth will realize that that's a much more difficult subject because uh, the data is uh, missing a lot. So we, we had to sit down and think about whether it was possible, and we thought we'd have a stab at it. And it's turned out to be, uh, uh, as I'll explain now, I think... Um, rather better than we had envisaged. Um, but this, 10 years ago, we started a project which was with Jim Davies, Ed Wolf, who's very well known in the US wealth field, Susanna Sandstrom, who was uh, working with us here as a research assistant. Since I left WIDER, we've uh, been continuing this because uh, Credit Suisse, uh, a wonderful organization that's had this insight into thinking, could we do something on global wealth? And uh, we've been saying yes, please, and uh, so we have been putting out an annual uh, wealth report uh, for them. We've had four years, and uh, it's just, you can go to the website and download it, and, uh, and, and the data associated with that is also available. So this is a big public, uh, public good. I have to say, I think that there's just amazing research opportunities here, because it, this is a field in which there's nobody that doing anything, and uh, there's a huge public interest, as we've already realized this year, particularly because of uh, Piketty's book. You know, this, is, this is a really uh, fallow field, and uh, anyone who really wants to make a name for themselves, there is huge opportunities. Uh, I think that's both Jim and I's, uh, my uh, views. We've been doing this with uh, Rodrigo, who's uh, here today. We've started another project which tries to do the same thing for income inequality, so and uh, with Sina Baymol, who's also here somewhere. Um, so I'll perhaps briefly talk about that as well. Um, this is the book which came out of the wider project, and uh, it's still available. And as Tony just said, I expect you might even be able to, if you can, I don't know whether there's any copies to buy here, but if, if you do have a copy, you can get the editor to sign that, since he's here as well. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting book and still, I think, uh, lots of uh, interesting material in there. When I was, uh, I have to say, some of my work on wealth has led me to think about some advice that I might give to people when they're working in the income and wealth field. 
One is, I think, uh, first of all, to be sceptical. And that is, I'm just struck all the time by how people just get a data set and just process it and discuss the, and uh, sort of discuss the results um, without really thinking about all the problems with the data. It's perhaps more of a problem. You're more conscious of this in the wealth field because, frankly, um, you know, the notion that you can go and collect survey data on wealth by knocking on someone's door and asking them how much they own you know, and then process the data and say this is the results is, is absurd when you think about it. But this is what happens. I mean, last year, the, uh, the uh, ECB, the central bank uh, in Europe, uh, in the Eurozone, uh, did a survey. They, they just collected data, they processed it and, and just um, put out the results. And it, it, it was just uh, almost scandalous, really. I mean, they came up with the... Uh, in their results, they came up with the notion that Malta and Cyprus had higher wealth than Germany. I mean, it caused a big... It's just complete nonsense. And it's simply because nobody sits down and actually says, is this data really reliable? You know, just think about it. Just test it. Um, but I think there's a lot of other data which people do do just rather process it rather unthinkingly, and you do have to, I think, not trust any data in this field um, unless you really have confidence in it. And I, I would give that advice because I think there's, you, know, you can benefit a lot from taking that advice. The second thing I've, I've learnt by doing this wealth is to try to be resourceful or in, in inventive, and that is you know, um, try to use data which is not the standard data and try and put things together and, and try to get an overall perspective from combining data from different sources and, and processing it in interesting ways. Um, we've done this in the wealth field in, in a couple of ways. First of all, usually you get data and it's lagging behind several years. We actually use, we are just now processing data for the middle of this year. We are about to publish wealth estimates for the middle of 2014. How do we do that? Well, because we use a lot of changes year to year in wealth holdings uh, are driven by what's happening to stock market prices. We have, we're working for Credit Suisse, so we, we, they give us the data on stock market indices to the end of, uh, end of June. We have house price indices, which we use for, as a proxy for uh, real assets. We have exchange rates, uh, quite easily available. So we use all this and we get, a, I think, a reasonable estimate of middle 2014. If you wait for all the data to, to come available, we're talking about two or three years lag. And of course, you know, things are changing quite rapidly in the world and it's much better to have up-to-date data. So that's a way in which we can use uh, some interesting available data to, uh, uh, in, in useful ways to, to get up-to-date uh, estimates. Um, Sorry. The other thing that we've been doing is to use data on top wealth holders. Um, there's actually quite a lot of that available. Every year it's, it's more and more available. We've, the Forbes data, which is the, the best known on billionaires, that goes back now, that's, uh, I think, in the 26th or 27 years of billionaire data. Um, the UK has a, a, a rich list, um, which they publish every year. They, they've done 25 years now. Um, there's lots of data for individual countries now with, uh, with, with that sort of uh, information. Um, there's problems about it, but which uh, I will also mention. But in terms of using that data, it, I think we're using it extensively, and I'll try and persuade you that it's, I think, a very valuable source of data. But also in the income field, I think we have, uh, we have now, uh, as Francois was talking today, uh, and, and the Paris, uh, the PSC database. There's lots of data on, on top wealth uh, income holders in, in, in various the top one percent. A lot of the data which you get and processing the survey data is not going to uh, really capture those top incomes. Can you somehow combine the two together to get a more realistic estimate of income inequality? And I would say yes. And I'm going to at least show you how we do it for wealth, so that you can perhaps do it also for income. Um, and that's one of, our, uh, one of our objectives as well. The last point here is to be humble, and that is, I, I think, in all of this field, we're, we're talk there's a lot of uncertainties here. And anyone who simply uh, starts to, 
talk about the, Gini, the third decimal point of the Gini coefficient and so on, I, I just wonder, uh, you know, I think you're giving a misleading impression. I think we have to just sort of say, you know, I think this seems to be the sort of trend we know. We, you know if you've got enough data year, put points for enough data years, you can have a little bit more confidence. But I think we, we're talking about here of quite large confidence intervals, and I think everyone should at least, um, I say, be humble in terms of what uh, conclusions you draw. Um, today, I'm just going to uh, say, I'm going to talk about the methodology we were using for our um, global wealth distribution side. I'm going to talk about the, the various problems that we've encountered. I'm going to actually end up offering a sort of alternative to the Lorenz curve as a method for capturing and analysing inequality data. And uh, if I'm, probably I, I won't have time to talk very much about the income side, but if there's some questions, I'll handle that as well. Um, this is briefly then, this is, what, this is our strategy for doing global wealth, for, for constructing a sort of global wealth uh, estimates, is first of all we try to estimate the average level of wealth in, in, in different countries. How do we do this? Well, some, data, some countries have good balance sheet data. Some other countries have some survey data. Where this is available, we use it. There's a growing number of countries, so we're now up, I forget exactly, but I think we're talking about 40-odd countries uh, that would have uh, some sort of data, Not certainly on the financial side, uh, uh, fewer, da fewer countries on the, uh, with non-financial data. We also, we then extend this to other countries by using regression methods because we think that there's a relationship between um, uh, income and uh, wealth and so we can sort of estimate what we think the asset holdings are in, in various countries that way. Other countries where we just can't do it at all, we like to have a, a complete picture of the world so for some other countries, we just sort of impute a number, which is the sort of regional average. These, are, these are, tend to be quite small countries or countries like uh, South, uh, North Korea, uh, Myanmar, um, Sudan, these sort of countries which, which you can't really do much about. But rather than just miss them out, uh, you know, some other people that talk about global income inequality, they just miss these countries out. So we just give an imputed value. Then we look at the distribution within each country. We do that. Some countries have, uh, have um, di a wealth distribution data, but it's when we started, it was really quite small. I think less than 20. Now it's up to around about 30. I'm, I'm sort of ballpark figures. Um, so we thought, well, what we can do here is, uh, if we haven't got the wealth distribution, we do have income distribution figures because we've got the WID data. And maybe there is a sort of systematic relationship between wealth inequality and income inequality. Wealth inequality is always higher. Um, and there is a sort of pattern. So we would estimate the Lorenz curve for the wealth distribution from the, from the income using the 20, 30 countries where we do have um, both wealth and income data. Um, so this was our strategy. And then we would add um, the... Um, again, impute values to countries that didn't have any income distribution data either. I should also have gone back and said, for the mean, for the, as I said before, for the recent years, we, use, we update the figures using, uh, using uh, recent data on what's been happening to the market capitalization in different countries and uh, house price indices and exchange rates. We then... Um, Oh, I should also mention that in order, one of the problems, uh, no, I won't mention problems, we, we have a little, we then use the distribution and the level, we generate a synthetic sample for each country, uh, uh, which exactly matches, which is consistent with the evidence that we have, consistent with the mean, consistent with the distribution, and we generate a sample, and then we throw this all together, this sample is actually now one point, it's a sample of 1.3 million. So it's, uh, um, you know, there's, it's roughly in proportion to the uh, size of the populations of the countries. Um, and then we process this and uh, generate our, and uh, 
discuss the results. What are the sort of problems? Well, some of them are problems which you have to tackle in the income side as well. You have problems with the, the definition of the income concept or the wealth concept. Um, again, I, I won't dwell on this. I'm just mentioned because it's not particularly interesting and, and it's a rather um, predictable, I suppose. We also have problems with the unit of analysis. This, this is, again, one which anyone who's been working in this field, even if you're working within a country, you have a problem of what distribution are you talking about. Um, for the wealth side, we've we adopted the strategy that we're going to talk about adults, which is a bit unusual because people usually talk about households or about the distribution across persons. We took the view that really uh, minors don't hold very much wealth, and so we've. And it's not really interesting to look at the distribution across the world's population. It's more interesting to look at the distribution across world adults. Um, and that actually seems to have been adopted by other people that work on wealth reports since we started that. Um, there's issues also about uh, exchange rates, what, whether we use current exchange rate or PPP, that type of thing, which uh, we are progressively now just keeping with uh, current, exchange, current USD exchange rates. Um, more interesting questions that uh, perhaps you, you won't have come across or the solutions you won't have come across one of the pro if you look at the WID you've got a lot of uh, it's in a particular form some countries you've got uh, quintile data sometimes it's DSR data you've got top 5% bottom 5% missing bits and pieces um, we've taken the view that we've, we put it all in a common framework, which is to look just to actually construct the Lorenz curve, where you get the missing points. Then we have a nice little utility which we wrote when we were uh, here at Rider, which is on the wider website, which is, generates a sort of synthetic distribution to exactly match the distribution. Um, the one that's on the wider website is, is the sort of first version one of this, We've since been uh, developed a more advanced one which gives you sample with different sort of weights. The reason why that's quite important in the wealth field is that we have, um, we're now using one sample point for each 10,000 observations. That's for each country. But when you get to the top 10% in each country, we have one for every 1,000. And when you get to the top 1%, we have one for every 100. This really gives us much more detail at the top end, which is uh, really where the, all the driving interest is coming. So that's how we, we generate this one, um, uh, 1 1.3 million observations around the world applying this, uh, this rule. Um, here's an interesting question. I think we, we has come up today a little bit, particularly with Francois, uh, I think about the question about residency. Um, it's not so, so important, perhaps, with the income side, although this question about people owning assets and keeping income or uh, having income from overseas and whether they remit it and so on is an issue. In the wealth side, it's really quite important because billionaires move around the world. And if you look at the Sunday Time Rich List for the UK, there's a lot of people that you wouldn't immediately think of being uh, British. In fact, uh, you know, about in the top three or four people are all um, you know, I think there's a couple of Russian billionaires in there. And then there's, but this issue does crop up quite a lot, and I think this is going to be another issue for the future. And it's, it's very often people do move around. Um, and certainly, if they, if they don't, some of their assets move around, and it's not quite sure whether you're, you're measuring them in the right sort of way. I, mention, I, just, I don't have a particular solution to this, but I think it is it's one which could be increasingly an issue for the future. The one which is really quite important, and I'm going to spend all my time, is, is the top tail adjustments. We think, in the case of wealth distribution, that the original data that we get, which is essentially from surveys, um, isn't accurate. It, uh, even in the best quality data, is, is not. Um, and in most countries, it's way off. So how do you somehow adjust the data to uh, correct it for these missing people. There's, there's, two, there's two problems. One is that you miss people because in surveys there's a, a lack of response by people uh, at the top end. Um, this is well recognized. Uh, the second issue is that they tend to under-report it. Um, and it's, 
it seems to be an endemic problem of surveys uh, that is some, to some extent it, it can be, uh, it, you can try to improve on, on it, but you're still going to be limited. Um, the last thing, uh, and last issue here, I don't think this is completely exhaustive, but there's questions about methods of presentation. Again, our experience of just sitting down and trying to present this data to various people, um, it's quite, you know, to think about how you present inequality data, certainly in a way that uh, is interesting to, um, to the uh, general audience, shall we say. I think it is quite a challenge, and uh, I think uh, just listening this morning, there's various sort of ways in which one does that quite successfully. I'm just going to mention, too, that we've, we've used, uh, we use quite a lot. When we started doing with Credit Suisse, they, they kept talking about a pyramid, uh, the wealth pyramid, and I, I, nobody had really thought about it, but then I thought, well, we could do it as a sort of wealth pyramid, and that's exactly what we do now. This is the sort of pyramid that we produce. We group people into those with assets less than $10,000, 10 to 100, 100 to a million, and over a million dollars, and the areas here are reflecting the size in the world. And uh, so it's, it's really quite an interesting way, and I think this would... One could do that for income side as well, quite happily. Um, the other thing which we do, which doesn't seem to be used, uh, I've never seen this used elsewhere, but I, I've, again, it's something that we used first time with, in the wider book, and I think is really quite interesting, is to look at the distribution of people uh, at different points in the distribution in the world. So this is just looking at the, the DSAR points in the world, and saying, where do these people live? And it's, uh, you could do this, of course, for in individual countries, and you could look at the, uh, the where people live within the country or, or uh, various sorts of characteristics. It would be a, and it's a rather interesting way, I think, of rather than a table of, of doing a visual presentation. What, um, this is the latest version um, that I've just taken from this year's report. China, you can see there, I mean, it, you look at this immediately, you think there's the dominance of India and China in the world, and China taking this really, really middle position. Ten years ago, when we first started, China was much more in the middle, and it's, you can just see it year by year, this great blob moving towards the right. Um, and I think it's really a, a sort of interesting, again, way of pr presenting um, the data. So Now, the real problem is here reflected in this diagram where we, um, this is just taking the data for China, which is given from a survey, and plotting it. What I've done here is to plot what you would normally do if you were looking at uh, Pareto tails. In other words, you plot the logarithm of the number of people with wealth above a certain leg, uh, level, and you use the log of wealth. If it's a Pareto distribution, you get a straight line. Um, you know, most times, you're, you're not going to get a straight line all the way down. Uh, but the, the notion that somehow, as it towards the end, it straightens out, that would be the, the characteristic of the Pareto distribution. The problem, as you can see here, is that... Uh, I'm trying to, oh, here we are. There's a little blob there. Where's that blob from? That is the billionaire data. Um, Back in the year 2000, China, I think, had one billionaire. And there is the billionaire. And you can see, if you were predicting that from the distribution, you are not going to get any billionaires. In fact, you would hardly get anyone with, uh, I would think, even uh, if you extend that, you get, to, what do you get to? You get maybe 10 million, uh, if you're lucky. Um, yeah, you, you wouldn't even get... This would predict that there would be, the, the biggest wealth in China would be 10 million or something. Clearly, they've got a billionaire. What's going on there? We think it's to do with all the, the problems that you have with survey data in the top tail. What do you do for that? Well, we've taken the view that we'll assume that we have a Pareto tail, and we'll assume that the billionaire observation is correct, and that we will somehow um, straighten out the line. Um, and use that as our adjusted distribution. The problem with this is you're, you're adding a huge amount of wealth in, so you then have to adjust the, 
the mean of the rest of the distribution down to, to correct it so that you're, you've adjusted for this extra wealth that you're adding in. So you just, we iterate, and we, we would then, <coughs> our adjusted distribution would be this sort of uh, dotted line here. Um, and this is what we, 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 we didn't do this with the, first, the wider study here. We just used the un, unadjusted data. When we started doing it for Credit Suisse, we have made these adjustments. It makes, I think, a huge difference to the uh, inequality in these countries. I mean, you get big jumps. Uh, with, we're talking about genies now, you know, if you're used to thinking genie of 40 or 50 or 60 is high, well, just forget it. We're talking about up in the 80s, uh, and, and the global genies are, are close to 90, I think. Um, so we are, you know, we're in a whole different uh, world here. Um, the problem is, what happens here? How do you, th this year we've been sitting and saying, can we get a series of inequality, wealth inequality, back to the year 2000? Um, and the trouble now is saying, okay, here is the data for China of 2005. If you keep your eye on that blob, um, as you, this is the, dist again, this is, would be the survey data, uh, that would be the billionaire data. As we go on, we're up here, China in the year 2010, roughly close to 100 billionaires, um, and... Here is 2013, it's 100 and, I don't know, uh, 150 or something billionaires. Again, you know, it's totally inconsistent with, with the survey data, so we've got to do something about this or, or, or really give up our exercise. Um, we get the same, and, and the question is, how can, uh, at least the initial thought, my, would be we just adjust this year by year. The problem there is, we think that the billionaire data can be jumping around for, it, it's really quite, we're talking still about quite small samples. For other countries it can be, we, here's China with 100 or so, but other countries could only have four, five, six, ten billionaires. Uh, you know, these are quite small samples. They can be jumping up and down each year if someone dies or, you know, or s splits their wealth. You can have quite erratic movements in billionaires. We could, we could be we're relying too much on, on data which seems to be uh, unreliable. Um, I, I'm just going to show you the, the US data because the US is just so, so wonderful, really. I mean, they just... This is, again, the same thing. I'm, I'm afraid when I was printing this, I realised there was a slight glitch somewhere in the US data and there's, there's obviously some grouping somewhere because of the way that uh, the data is being generated. So just forget about that. I'll sort that out at some point. The point to make here is, here's the, uh, here's the US figure. This is the, just their survey data, the, the Survey of Consumer Finances. And you can see, actually, the, uh, uh, the US has got something like uh, 100. Um, it's actually got more billionaires, 10 to the power of 2, just 100. And this is the, for the year 2000. Even so, we were able to generate our sample is, is, I told you we were having one for every hundred people, so when they get to uh, billionaires of, in the hundreds, we, we, may, we actually have a data point in our data set which is uh, going to represent that. Um, here's the figure for uh, 2013. Again, we've got sort of 400, I forget now, uh, four or 500 billionaires in the US. So our data point is we've probably got a couple of data points in our data set. Um, but again, you see just how good it is. There's hardly any adjustment needed for the U.S. The U.S., I think, claims to just be about miss the top, uh, about 2%. It only misses, really, the billionaires uh, from their data set, and it's roughly 2% of uh, wealth. So the, the U.S. data, they claim it doesn't need much adjustment, and in fact, it, you know, that's very strong evidence here. The U.S., the data seems to be way above, uh, much better than any other country Possibly, there may be one or two other countries that, that do something that's, that's pretty close. I think Canada, I don't know, maybe, maybe Italy, um, certainly not the UK. Uh, you wouldn't get uh, anything like that. Um, so the, the, but the problem is, how do you combine these in different sort of years? And this, this is my good idea, I have to say now. Um, instead of... Here, we're, we're plotting the logarithm of the number of people. Here, we're plotting the logarithm of wealth. 
Suppose that we do here, we plot the percentage, the logarithm of the percentage of the population. And here, not wealth, but wealth relative to the mean wealth of the country. You know, what multiple of mean wealth it is. The great advantage of that is you're adjusting for the population size, you're adjusting for the mean changes in mean wealth. So in terms of simple things, it is any, if we make that adjustment, we're now, um, if all that's happening is there's a change in population or there's a change in mean, the actual curve doesn't change. It is uh, replication invariant and uh, whatever it is, mean independent. I, I forget what terms I've used in the past. But, um, so that allows us to say, if inequality is not changing, this distribution shouldn't change. But of course, the mean changes, so the billionaire point changes. And what you then get is a fixed curve if there's no change in the distribution. And you can plot all the billionaire points, not just for a single year, but for every year, or indeed, you know, any rich list data, on the same diagram. So here we have now, um, this is, is tracking the US figures. This is the billionaire data for, back to the year 2000, all plotted on the same line. And you can see, roughly speaking here, that the billionaire data, as mean wealth goes up, as it has been in the US, uh, the billionaire points are moving toward, there's more billionaires, because there's more people being pushed over the line. Um, if inequality is not ch changing, it'll just track up that, up, up that curve. Um, and indeed, that is roughly what's been happening to the US. The evidence here is that uh, there's a very little uh, inequality change for the last, uh, uh, since the year 2000. Here's the one for Australia, which I think is even nicer, because it's, uh, Australia's had rather bigger increases in wealth, partly because its uh, exchange rate's been appreciating. And here's a, you know, here is the, the distribution curve, adjusted for one year, but we're keeping that distribution fixed. Now, you can see, you're plotting the logarithm of the percentage here, so that it's always two at the top here. 100% of the population is going to be the top end. Here is Australia. And except for the first couple of points uh, up here in the first early 2000, 2001, you can look at the data. You know, you're just tracking up. It's just moving straight up here, which I'm interpreting as being almost no change in inequality year on year uh, and simply moving up. Uh, so this is a, a country in which wealth inequality has not been changing over time. But I, you know, what's exciting me here is Instead of relying on having billionaire data for one year and we just, you know, could be jumping around, here we've, we're plotting them all and we can actually, uh, uh, we can smooth out the data and actually get uh, something which avoids some of the year-on-year -year variations. Um, sorry? Ten minutes. Oh, that's plenty. I've got, uh, I've got lots of... I've uh, thought I would uh, interest... <laughs> For the minister, uh, I've got a little diagram for everybody here now. This is uh, Brazil again. Here the, the billionaires are going up, but they're tracking up uh, pretty well along the line, indicating that wealth inequality, I mean, I, I'll look in more detail in a minute, but you know, it doesn't seem to be that it's huge change in wealth inequality in, in, in Brazil over the time. Who else have we got? And this is for Francois. Is he, uh, um, Francois, well, uh, it actually looks like here, where uh, if you interpret this, these are the early years. We're moving in this direction, which actually tends to, it, I'm interpreting this as, as actually, if we started with the line here and the line gradually moves in this direction, it means there's falling wealth inequality. Um, I'll, uh, that's roughly what's happening. I'll, uh, what have I, I've got here for... Uh, uh, here's the Italian data. Again, not a huge... Uh, hu doesn't seem to be huge trend. Oh, well, I'll, at least there's not as much uh, obvious trend as there, there would be some up from other countries. Uh, Mexico, this is for Nora. Um, this is my Nora diagram for Mexico. Again, um, I don't quite... I, I, since you can't really tell which is the first year or, or the later years, I'm not sure about the trend there, but it's not quite, it's not so evident as it is for Australia where it sort of tracks up, up the, the curve. 
So uh, um, here's the UK. Um, but again, all these points, interesting because we can plot them all on the same and we can start processing in the way. Now, here is some interesting one. Here is China. What's happening here? Well, here is China in the year 2000. The line would be right down here. As it goes, as we're going over time, it's moving up here. And what's that mean? It means wealth inequality is going up big time in China. And this, this is, uh, you know, looking at this data, that's giving you a big signal that that's happening. Um, here's the one. Here's India again going up, trending upwards. Here is the, you know, here's the, the early years, and we're trending up here. Here's Russia again, the same uh, sort of trend, perhaps not quite as, as strong as it is in, in China, but again, increasing inequality. So um, let me just move back. What... Uh, what this allows you to do now is to look at, to take a sort of con uh, one line. I've, I've taken, for each year, I've taken the sort of average. What I've done is taken all of the um, uh, Forbes data, combined that into a sort of single representative point, uh, computed the, c the curve uh, based on that average, and then looked at deviations each year from that line. So you look now and you see... To what extent is it deviating? Is it above the line or below the line? Um, and by how much? And then you can plot those against uh, each year. Uh, the T here refers to the time since the year 2000. So this is France. Um, and I have to say, um, what is quite evident in this data is that there seems to be uh, reduced inequality up to the financial crisis, and then the, cr the crisis is changing and it's going up. Um, in fact, I've just done a, a sort of um, made that assumption and assume that there's a, a split. Um, there's a, a change in 2008. So here we have France. Uh, the, so we're trending. Here are the deviations. It was above the line, but the line is going, uh, it's, it's going down. And then the the deviations are going up again. So we've got reduced inequality for France going up again uh, in the period since uh, the year 2008. Here's Italy. Again, you look at the dots. There seems to be a pretty clear pattern there uh, that uh, Andrea would uh, perhaps recognise. I don't know whether sometimes it's evident. But, I mean, it's the, the French thing is it in... Because there's so much interest, um, Piketty is uh, generating this discussion in France. It may be it's, it's a groundswell of opinion, thinking that inequality is going, wealth inequality is going up in France. And this uh, data would so, so, certainly tend to suggest that. So uh, that would be consistent, and in Italy, and indeed. Um, here's Mexico. Well, not so much. I mean, the, uh, the Mexican figures are... Uh, showing declining, again, up to the year 2008, a little bit of a, a, a jump, whatever else. Here's the U.S. The U.S. is quite interesting because it's been, it's been the main focus of all the discussion this year about what's happening to wealth inequality in the U.S. Here is, um, so um, this is, these are the sort of, and this, as I said, the, the SCF data is very close to, to our numbers here, so we, we're, not, uh, we're not differing very much. Um, in fact, the U.S. data is probably, probably good enough that you could take the individual year-on-year -year variations. Here we are. We seem to be, um, I forget now, according to the SCF, it looks like, I think 2010 is their latest figure, and they said wealth inequality was higher than 2007, which is correct, I mean, according to these numbers here. Um, Beyond that, before that, it was fairly flat. Again, this is exactly what we're generating here with our numbers. Um, but the indication here is we've generated the last three years and our, we think that the numbers are falling. So when the, when the, uh, when the SCF come out with their next data, which is, will be for the year 2013, then according, if I were betting, I would bet that actually it would be going down. And that's going to confound quite a few people because they think that there's a, a trend going up. Uh, I, I'm a 
about to, uh, I'm getting close to finishing. But here is China, again, just all the time, just unrelentless wealth inequality going up, uh, particularly fast in the, up, to, up to the financial crisis. Not so fast now, but it's still in, rising. Here, India, where it's got flat, um, was rising up to 2008, now seems to be flat. Um, Europe in general, moving up uh, fairly slowly, but uh, was going down, so not much change really since the year 2000. Africa. Um, one of the problems, of course, is that a lot of this billionaire data is there's not enough observations really to do individual countries. In those cases, I've just done it. I've sort of put all the data together for Africa, used the billionaire data for Africa, adjusted the distribution, and then given it back to the individual countries, sort of separated it out. Um, but there you are in Africa. It looks like since 2008, it is uh, that inequality is increasing quite strongly. Canada's is one of the unusual cases where uh, it seems to have gone down. That's a pattern quite common to lots of countries up to the year 2008, but it's still at least flat or perhaps even slightly decreasing since then. Australia, again, I told you that it was tracking up, and that's exactly what's happening here. There's almost no trend at all in the Australian data. And that is actually the last slide. Um, so uh, I'm probably perfect in my timing. Um, I don't know what generally I uh, say. We, I think one of the implications here, I think, for if you're not interested in wealth inequality, uh, uh, clearly, I think there's lots to be done here. And this, this is not just with the Forbes data, because there's lots of countries which do have rich list data, and you can use this and, uh, and perhaps get longer series and, and do some interesting work. Um, and this is really quite easy to do. Um, and so I, you know, I could see quite a lot of interesting little studies for individual countries uh, using these sort of techniques. For incomes, I think one could do the same sort of thing. We do have uh, data now on the top 1% incomes in lots of countries. We do have income distribution data. My guess is it would have the same problem that the top 1% is not, that you get from uh, the top 1% database is not the numbers that you get from the survey type data. Can you match them together in the same sort of way and look at trends over time? I think that would really be interesting and uh, really uh, you know, an important contribution. So I'm, I'm really quite excited about this. I think it opens up uh, huge research possibilities. And I have to say, this is, there, there is not enough researchers certainly working in this, in this uh, field. Um, and I think particularly looking at trying to look across countries, because what, you know, one of the things we do try to do is get comparable data for different countries. Otherwise, when you're trying to compare different countries, I think you're always rather dependent on the way that they've the, in, the variations in the individual countries can be bigger than the differences between countries. So this allows you, I think, to make much more of a sort of a consistent, comparable uh, view of the world and how individual countries rank in, the, in, in their positions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... <clears throat>